um, I thought I was um, muted. Um, we today discussed the next MFF and the Commission proposal for a recovery package that was discussed uh, just last week at the Virtual Council Summit. Um, the last time we had an event uh, with Gertjan was uh, just at the end of February after the inconclusive uh, Council Summit on the multiannual financial framework that happened then. Um, a lot has changed since February, uh, the global pandemic and the related economic crisis changed the world and changed the role of public policy. This is also true for EU policy. Um, everyone agrees today that there needs to be a common EU response to the crisis to relaunch the economy and support most vulnerable sectors and regions. Uh, the Commission at the end of May, what well, just one month ago, put forward a groundbreaking proposal to borrow on the financial market 750 billion euros to then be used to support member states in the form of grants and loans. Um, what is the proposed structure? How would this work in practice? Will it fly politically? These are the questions that we discuss with Gatti and Krugman for the next hour. Um, before we start, uh, just a bit of um, housekeeping. This is an interactive discussion, so uh, in the audience, you can ask your questions. Uh, you can do this in two ways. You can type your question in the Q&A box on the side of your screen. Uh, please keep it short and clear so that I can uh, read it out loud. Um, or you can also raise your hand um, and then I will give you the floor to ask your question um, in person. Um, so, let's get us started. Uh, EU leaders discussed these Commission proposals last week uh, at the virtual summit. Uh, they did not reach an agreement, but they will meet again in a few weeks on the 17th of July. And there are hopes that these will lead to an agreement. Um, Gertian, let's let us kick off. Uh, what is the structure of this proposal? What is the rationale for these exceptional measures? Um, thank you. Thank you, Marta, and it's uh, good to be back, uh, although it seems uh, like uh, a decade ago, at least, uh, you, you reminded us that it's only a few months ago that we, uh, we had a, a chat about uh, the MFF negotiations. Um, but uh, in uh, substantive terms, uh, we are indeed in a very different world uh, because of the Corona crisis uh, and because of the, the proposal which the Commission has made, which is a very different proposal, as you, as you know, in essence. What we have proposed is to uh, enrich uh, the MFF uh, uh, proposal with a, an instrument called Next Generation EU that would allow to significantly invest in recovery and uh, resilience uh, to do that in a way that would further uh, the green and digital transitions, which are the main policy uh, objectives uh, of this uh, Commission. Um, and that would be funded, and I think this is uh, attracting quite a lot of interest, this would be funded not through member states' contributions, but uh, through uh, borrowing uh, at the capital markets, uh, based on an authorization uh, in, uh, uh, in law, obviously, in the uh, own resources decision, and uh, based on uh, a legal act uh, that would set out uh, the uh, key areas where the monies would have to be spent under Article 122 of the Treaty. Uh, this is clearly exceptional, it's clearly time limited, uh, um, but it is justified uh, in view of the enormous uh, uh, damage that is being done to the EU economy, to the world economy, I should say, and the need to avoid divergences uh, within the EU across the internal market on account of uh, differences in member states' capacity to react to it, for example, on account of their fiscal capacity. So we're, we're trying to get out of this together stronger. Uh, clearly, this is not a time uh, to put uh, more debt on member states, and therefore it is uh, economically uh, rational uh, uh, to uh, use uh, this uh, exceptional uh, uh, time-limited provision that we have, uh, have proposed. Um, interestingly, uh, our assessment shows that uh, not only would it have a very significant effect in, in terms of avoiding divergences within the internal market, helping those that are harder hit uh, according to the forecasts uh, more than, than the others, but actually it would help everyone. So everyone would be a winner. And I think that is an important element in this discussion. This is not your typical uh, classical budget debate where uh, to some extent there is a zero sum logic. What you give to one, you cannot give to the other. 
And this is a, a, a proposal where everyone uh, stands to gain uh, significantly, and our forecasts uh, even suggest that uh, the measures would be uh, largely self-financed. Now, obviously, uh, borrowing on the capital markets means that the monies would have to be repaid. We have proposed that that should commence uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, not with the next MFF, but in 2028, with the MFF coming after the, the next one, over a 30-year period, uh, in essence, to ensure that uh, the repayments would not weigh on the economy uh, for, for uh, uh, the medium term as it uh, emerges from the crisis. And the repayments we have also suggested should, uh, to, a large, to a much larger extent and, and possibly fully, than uh, is the case today uh, in terms of financing the budget, come from new own resources. So I've also made suggestions to this effect. Um, the uh, discussion has, uh, has been very intensive, both at the technical level and uh, last uh, week, uh, I think Friday, last week indeed, uh, there was a first uh, European uh, uh, Council video conference. Um, so all in all, uh, after that, so we are now set for a uh, European Council uh, in mid uh, in mid July, and the Commission is hopeful, uh, also based based on the encouraging uh, uh, signals that, that there is a degree of convergence amongst member states that we will be able to conclude the negotiations in July as we had originally proposed. Thank you, uh, uh, Marta. Thanks, uh, Gertian. Um, let's let's dig deeper in, in a few of the points you've mentioned. Um, um, as you said, this will enrich uh, the existing MFF. Um, how would the link between Next Generation EU and the MFF work in practice? Uh, we see, for example, that some MFF programs um, budget are increased by Next Generation EU, um, the Just Transition Fund, for example, Horizon, uh, Europe um, and others. Um, how would this work in practice and what would happen after 2024? when next generation EU is supposed to, to end effectively? Well, indeed, I, I think one of the key features uh, and big advantages of this approach is that one uses the programs under the budget, the governance structures that come with it, the accountability and control structures that come with it to uh, expend uh, the money. Um, and uh, therefore we are uh, uh, essentially using a number of existing and new uh, programs in the budget to spend uh, to spend this money quickly, uh, because the crisis needs uh, to be addressed uh, now. And in fact, we have also proposed to already uh, have some expenditure, fresh uh, money uh, this year uh, under the current MFF, which we are proposing to open up, notably to deal with immediate needs uh, of member states and uh, uh, the need to uh, shore up the solvency of uh, of hard hit uh, companies that are fundamentally sound. So. That is uh, the, uh, the main uh, rationale to use the budget. Um, um, and uh, we believe that that is actually uh, something which now has, uh, has been accepted uh, pretty much by everybody because uh, uh, it is not so easy to spend this money well. What will then happen after 2024? Well, as I said, this comes on top of the uh, 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 normal MFF, uh, the baseline MFF, if you would like to use that uh, terminology. So the normal MFF would continue, but obviously, this means that the uh, level of expenditure uh, at EU level would taper off uh, uh, towards uh, the second half of, uh, of the MFF uh, period as the normal MFF uh, uh, continues. Uh, so that's, that's the overall architecture which we have proposed. Uh, and as I said before, I think there is a, a large uh, measure of consensus that it should be structured in this way. And let's... Um... Let's focus on the time issue. Um, you've said that some expenditure will be uh, mobilized already in, in 2020. Um, so if you could please elaborate on that. Uh, but also, um, how in practice, how long will this take in practice? Uh, we know that the own resources decision that has to be changed to uh, allow the Commission to borrow on the markets has to be ratified by national parliaments. Um, some worry that this is a bit uh, risky because it might take um, a lot of time. What, what can you expect on that, on that regard? Uh, when effectively do you think the Commission, if the package is approved, could start um, committing money and borrowing on the market? Well, as, as far as this year is concerned, um, 
the decision making could in, in actual fact uh, uh, be completed very quickly uh, because that does not require uh, any uh, reopening of the own resources decision which as you know and i think you were alluding at this uh, needs to be ratified by by national parliaments for 2020 the only thing we will do is increase uh, uh, the ceilings of the current mff that is a decision that has to be adopted by unanimity uh, by the council parliament has to uh, also express itself uh, obviously uh, but that money would then be rooted uh, principally through uh, this solvency instrument i've been alluding to uh, on the one hand and uh, the uh, uh, REACT EU uh, instrument, which effectively aims at using cohesion policies to shore up uh, member states. This is crisis repair uh, money. Now, the expenditure in 2021 under this next generation EU is, is fully dependent on the adoption of the own resources decision. In the past, this has taken quite long, uh, but in principle, if we uh, reach an agreement uh, uh, in July, uh, and the Parliament uh, and the Council work together closely, then it should be possible to start uh, the ratification uh, procedure uh, in the summer of this year. That should, uh, if uh, due attention is given to it and sufficient uh, priority is attached to it, that should allow uh, the new uh, own resources decision to be in place uh, early next year. Uh, the sectoral legislation, in other words, the programs, would, would then also uh, uh, be, be available. And uh, last but not least, the new MFF, the baseline MFF, will also be in place, so that uh, in a you know in a very expedited manner, decisions would would have to be taken in the, in the coming uh, seven months uh, to allow the programs to kick off uh, next year. Um, thanks. Let's let's move to the expenditure side. So, how will this money um, be um, distributed or lent to member states? Uh, we have a question from the audience from uh, Zoltan Yevve, sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, he's saying that some governments are asking the Commission uh, to change the distribution criteria for the Recovery and Resilience Facility, um, moving away from um, unemployment figures of the past. Um, why was this criteria chosen in the first place? And, and what do you say about these critiques that this is not necessarily related to today's um, health crisis? And what, what, what could be the alternative um, the participant asks? Well, first of all, let me, let me say it's not surprising that uh, there is a discussion about allocation keys, because obviously the allocation keys dictate who gets what, and many member states have an interest uh, in all these type of discussions and budget discussions to, to look for keys that uh, generate higher shares uh, or, uh, for, for them. So that's not surprising. Now, it is true uh, uh, that the key for the RRF, this recovery and resilience facility is based on uh, 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 structural unemployment data, which obviously therefore related to us. But the logic here is that uh, this is uh, an excellent uh, indicator of resilience, the strength of the economies, and uh, what we have seen uh, based on our forecast, and not just our forecast, also the OECD forecast, the IMF forecast, is that resilience is a very good predictor of uh, recovery needs. And so the, the hit to the economy and the damage to the economy, the uh, amount of funds needed to, to recover, is very strongly uh, correlated uh, with uh, with uh, this resilience. So, if you uh, look at uh, the application of this key, uh, you will actually see that most of the money, proportionally speaking, then uh, would would go to countries like Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Greece that that are likely to be very very hard hit on account of uh, uh, the uh, the early uh, impact of the crisis, the uh, uh, size of their services sector, the tourism sector, the duration of the lockdown. So all of these things are reflected uh, actually quite well. Uh, final point, you, you know, we need to get started early. We were just discussing it, know that we, we have to get the show on the road in 2021. If you were to take uh, a, a, a dynamic distribution key, as some people have argued, then you would have to start updating this with the forecasts and you would not have a stable basis for, for drawing up uh, your budgets for your plans. So we, we continue to believe that this is the right way forward. Okay, thanks. And and, and no, uh, still on, on expenditure, um, <laughs> the the recovery and resilience facility expenditure is very much linked to um, the European semester um, country recommendations, the um, 
the plans that the member states will have to um, will have to um, draft and agree with the Commission. Uh, what kind of uh, conditions do the member states have to fulfil to be able to access the, the resilience uh, facility uh, funding? Um, and how would this work in practice? And what is the role of the Commission and of the member state um, in this process? Well, um, I, I think here there is a, a very important uh, policy principle namely that these uh, expenditures for reforms and investments should be linked uh, to uh, the European semester, which is our overall overarching economic governance framework of the EU, uh, reflecting also, uh, as expressed uh, in the European semester, our green and digital uh, transition logic. So member states will need to come forward with uh, plans setting out uh, uh, reforms and investments that are pertinent to those recommendations, pertinent to the analysis, also in the country reports under the European semester done over the past years, uh, to on that basis address uh, uh, the recovery needs, but also the resilience needs in a way that 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 that, that deals also with this uh, green and digital uh, transition. Now, given the scale uh, of monies involved, and it's probably useful reiterating that this facility alone would cover 310 billion euros of grants and 250 billion euros of loans, so 560 billion euros in total, which is huge. This means that the plans actually have to be really granular, have to be very mature, uh, will have to span a number of years. The Commission has clearly indicated that the expenditures uh, uh, under uh, the uh, next generation EU should, should, should be allowed up to four years, with heavy front loading, 60% in the first two years. But you know, you're looking at really massive uh, economic uh, uh, reform and recovery uh, instruments uh, that uh, therefore will have to uh, be underpinned by solid analysis, uh, by detailed uh, milestones. Uh, uh, payments will also be in respect of milestones, uh, 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 and these will all be uh, tailored to the need of individual countries. The Commission has proposed that member states uh, uh, come forward with their plans and that the Commission approve these, approves these plans after also consulting in a comatology procedure <coughs> uh, member states. Uh, uh, so this is a very serious operation which, if you will, uh, uh, dynamizes uh, uh, the European semester, which uh, has always had recommendations for countries but, but was not attached with any uh, uh, powerful uh, funding arm as it, as it would now have. And, and what about the rule of law conditionality? This has been a bit um, under the radar, uh, maybe um, overwhelmed by the European semester approach. Um, what, is, what is the Commission's view on that? And, and where do you expect, uh, if at all, to find a, a landing zone with, with the member states in this? Well, the, the Commission has underlined in its communication that it stands fully by its proposals on the rule of law. This is a horizontal conditionality applying to uh, the entire budget, so it's not specific to the uh, recovery and resilience facility. Uh, so we would expect that this is also part of the political agreement on the next MFF. Uh. Right. And um, another question on, on timelines from, from Jennifer Hollings in the audience. Um, we know from the past MFF that they um, agreed at the last moment and that the sectoral programs um, and the programming processes adopted during the first MFF. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit. Um, so the question is at, at the beginning of the MFF, spending is always uh, very low, and implementer, implementers depend um, on new funds. Um, at the first, the, at the first of the period, they have gaps in assistance and, and services. Um, it, is there a risk that the next generation EU money would also suffer from this gap uh, at the beginning of the period? And, and how do you plan to mitigate this issue? Yes. No, we are we are late. Uh, uh, that, that is very clear with uh, with all of this uh, for for significant uh, uh, expenditure to start uh, on the first of January twenty twenty one. We know this. Uh, but it's important to consider the following points. First, uh, as far as cohesion policy is concerned, one important uh, element that is in integrated uh, in our proposals is this REACT-EU cohesion facility, which 
builds on the flexibilities that were actually decided this year for the remainder of the programming period that have made uh, the cohesion funds uh, a, a, a very powerful tool to uh, engage in crisis repair investments. Uh, some more than 50 billion euros of monies that had not been committed were uh, essentially flexibilized through this proposal that was adopted in, in, in just two weeks in, in March. And what we are doing with React EU is, is, is taking forward for another two years that logic uh, uh, and uh, equipping it with another 50 billion euros of, uh, of funds. So, so that should, uh, because we're talking about extending uh, existing programs, continuing uh, uh, the fight uh, uh, against the crisis in terms of crisis repair, all of that should, should, should actually be uh, uh, feasible uh, 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 without uh, any uh, uh, significant delays and discontinuation. And the Commission, of course, has already invited member states to come and talk to us uh, uh, on the on the reprogramming uh, uh, of of these of, of these funds. For the RRF, uh, it's a little bit of a different story because the the member states need to come forward with their plans now. Some of them are already reaching out to us, and and I'm I'm sure that as of the autumn there will be much more uh, intensive contact, which I personally would welcome. Uh, but uh, uh, that is uh, just one element uh, which uh, we. we bring uh, to the table. There's also technical support. We have a technical support program. There's actually a whole DG devoted to this that will be available to work with member states to help them uh, develop uh, reforms. Uh, uh, so the Commission services will need to assist uh, uh, through these different uh, uh, means uh, member states to, to uh, be in a position to, to hit the ground uh, running uh, next year. And, and, and something related to that and, and the role of implementers, uh, we have a question from uh, Pietro Reviglio in the audience, um, who is asking about um, the participation of different level of governments. So, for example, re uh, local and regional authorities. Um, is, there is there participation in the drafting of the recovery and resilience plans uh, um, envisaged or and um, does the Commission uh, plan to um, increase the granularity of data, for example, at the NAS3 level uh, rather than just regional level in the European semester and country specific recommendations uh, to ensure that these um, are fit for purpose and that investment reach uh, the areas that, um, that are most in need uh, of this investment? Well, Marta, um, the, um, the involvement of national and local, uh, regional and local authorities in the development of the plans is first and foremost the responsibility of member states, uh, obviously. But given that we're talking about investments uh, in green, which often translate into investments at a regional level, um, and, and the same to some extent, a lesser extent, but, but, but still significantly is true for digital investments, I would imagine that member states do this, and we would certainly encourage them uh, to do so. But it's not the Commission that will be having this dialogue in the context of the RRF with, with, with local authorities. Uh, obviously, for the structural uh, uh, funds, uh, uh, you know, there is, uh, by definition, uh, an, an emphasis on, uh, uh, on, on, on the regional level. Uh, that's inherent in the policy, and that will continue. And as I have explained, react to you, this, this special occasion, uh, crisis repair instrument is an important part of it. Uh, Thanks. Um, thanks for that. And let's move on. Let's move back on the payment. Uh, you have mentioned uh, briefly in your introductory remarks um, um, how the Commission intends to repay this back, uh, this debt back. And um, could you go a bit more in detail into the options uh, that the Commission has put on the table um, to ensure that this debt does not drag along um, in the future? Yes. Well, I, I think the first point I would make is that. Um, you know, the repayment needs, uh, according to our proposal, they come in the next MFF. So we have a little bit of time, not much time, but we have a little bit of time to, to deal with that, uh, given that in our proposal that would, would, would become pertinent from 2028 onwards. These repayments would be from normal budget appropriations, so they would come from, from the, the, the MFF, uh, uh, and therefore they would be financed uh, through uh, uh, own resources. Uh, be it member states' contributions or, or, or other own resources. Now, um, that, that means that uh, uh, unless uh, we uh, address this issue now in the coming uh, few years, uh, there would be a, a pressure point uh, next time round, uh, given that uh, the repayments would eat into uh, the available budgetary uh, means. 
So this is why we made this proposal to uh, uh, endow the, the budget with, with further, uh, um, further uh, uh, new own resources. Uh, we have not made a formal proposal beyond the ones we made in 2018. Don't forget there is still the, uh, the ETS proposal, which would bring fresh money uh, to the budget. Uh, but uh, we have highlighted the possibility to further extend uh, the ETS uh, 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 own resource in the future by increasing uh, the, the sectoral scope, uh, for example. Um, secondly, we have uh, suggested that a carbon, carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism to level the playing field with regards to our climate policies uh, could be considered as, as bringing also uh, uh, money to the budget, so the proceeds of such a mechanism could flow into the budget. Um, and that, uh, just to take this one step further, could be linked uh, to extending the emission trading uh, system, because as you, as you know, one of the options that we are going to be looking at in this context is to uh, uh, require importers to purchase uh, uh, such emission allowances alongside uh, uh, domestic uh, producers. So that, that could bring uh, uh, significant money. The Commission has also uh, uh, proposed a digital tax already some time ago. Discussions in the OECD uh, uh, have been uh, moving forward. Uh, you know that the Americans uh, pulled out of it, at least uh, at this juncture, temporarily. But the Commission continues to believe that uh, uh, a digital tax uh, that uh, ensures uh, a, a stronger correlation between where the economic activity exists on the one hand and where the taxation takes place on the other hand is is, is important and this could also bring uh, money to the budget and finally uh, we, we we had proposed back in 2018 um, uh, to use uh, a, a slice uh, of the uh, common uh, consolidated corporate tax base uh, as, as an own resource now that the CCCTV as it is called uh, was never uh, adopted uh, this is why we have suggested that a contribution from uh, uh, larger enterprises uh, could uh, could flow through the budget, uh, and this could take the form of uh, of, of, of a levy uh, uh, on, uh, on, on on turnover or, or or a lump sum payment uh, that would uh, would flow into the budget. Now, it's important to underline that these are not at this juncture concrete proposals. Not yet. We are we are we are we're just putting this on the table with a strong indication that we think it would make sense uh, to, to introduce those. We have also, uh, on a preliminary basis, basis, costed them. They could bring uh, enough money to cover the repayment needs. Uh, that's an important signal. Um, and uh, uh, it would uh, be possible, we believe, to have them in place uh, from 2024 uh, onwards. And then uh, we would uh, indeed be uh, well in time for uh, the repayment needs, which, which would start arising as I've explained in, in 2028. Um, thanks. I want to go back on the on the levy on, on big companies operating in the single market, because that, I think, is the one that has attracted uh, the most attention um, also in the media. How, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Commission calculated that this could bring about 10 billion a year. Um, I was wondering if you could go a bit more in detail on, on how that could that could work in practice and um, and, and if you see that this is something that the member states could, could rally behind. Yeah, well, it's, it's too early to, to say on your second question, too early to say whether the member states rally behind this. Uh, these are all uh, commission uh, uh, suggestions uh, at this stage. So we haven't had uh, 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 any final decision making on this point yet. Uh, but in terms of how this could uh, could be taken forward, well, you know, we th these are very serious uh, uh, instruments. So we would impact assess them. We would we would do a proper consultation on all of them. Uh, the same is true for for the border carbon uh, adjustment mechanism. Uh, in terms of the uh, the contribution from enterprises in the internal market, you know, a very simple way would be for for, for companies to pay a very very small uh, share, uh, you know, a fraction of a percent uh, on their turnover. Uh, uh, which would bring, uh, as you have seen in the communication, uh, considerable uh, revenues, and which could be a, a, a proxy, if you will, for uh, for uh, uh, corporate uh, taxation. But all of these things are going to be looked at. I think the Commission is committed to the own resources uh, uh, dimension of our proposal. It's very important for the Parliament, as you know. So uh, this is something that uh, will no doubt uh, feature prominently in the discussions in July. Um, there, we have one question um, from
from uh, Nicolas Hodak on, on the new own resources and in particular on the plastic levy. Um, if you could go a bit in detail into how that would work and specifically if, is the, if the plastic levy at the EU level would be compatible uh, with current national proposals for a plastic tax or if these national proposals would have to be adjusted to, to do yeah. the levy. Well, it's, it's important to point out this is not, uh, it's sometimes portrayed as a, as a European plastics tax. Uh, it's not a European plastics tax, it's actually a, a national contribution to the budget that uh, is based on an allocation key uh, that looks at unrecycled, uh, the, the share of unrecycled plastic in, in, in total plastic waste. So it is uh, very important to be very clear about that. We, we wouldn't be imposing any, any European tax on anybody. Uh, uh, this is for member states to, to develop. Obviously, if member states uh, uh, have uh, uh, national plastic taxes, uh, this would uh, improve uh, their share uh, of, uh, of recycled plastics, uh, uh, undoubtedly, in, in the mix, and that would reduce their contribution to the EU budget. So in that sense, this, this uh, financing instrument of the budget, this national contribution, gives an incentive uh, to member states to, to do the right thing. In that sense, it has a Pigouvian, if you're, if you're an economist, a Pigouvian dimension uh, uh, to it. Um, thank you. We're getting a few more questions uh, in writing. I want to just remind the audience that you can also raise your hands and you will be given the floor to ask your question um, in person. Um, we have a question uh, from Olalia Rubio, who is asking about the very recent um, opinion from the Council of Legal Services uh, that to be in line with the Article 122, um, the money of the recovery funding has to be clearly targeting to tackle the COVID-related crisis. Um, do, do you see this as, a, as an issue for, for the Commission's proposal? So was this taken into account? No, I, I, actually, this, this is a bit of a no-brainer. Obviously, uh, logically, we are we're bringing forward programs and, and expenditures that address the crisis. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it uh, in the first place. Uh, so we believe that uh, all of the proposals that we have made uh, are squarely addressing uh, crisis needs. Uh, um, and uh, therefore, uh, while, where, where we might not have uh, fully uh, exhaustively explained this, we, we stand ready to, to, to clarify this. But Please rest assured, all of our proposals are aimed at addressing uh, the, the, the crisis. This is not a normal way of financing the budget, because the normal way of financing the budget is through the system of, of own resources. Uh, and, uh, you know, the borrowing uh, that we have proposed is not an own resource. Uh, that, that, that needs to be very clear. Thank you. Um, uh, let's move to, to governance um, and in particular the role of Parliament uh, in, in uh, Next Generation EU. Um, some have argued for the need for the Parliament to be European Parliament to be a bit more involved, for example, when it comes to the uh, plans that the national members, the member states will, will present. Um, and in particular, we have a question uh, on React EU uh, from uh, Giacomo Manca, and he is asking whether React EU would follow the ordinary procedure um, and thus allow Parliament to formulate its own opinion on this. Yeah. No, I, I think there are different dimensions to this. Uh, one very horizontal dimension is that we are talking here, uh, as, I've, as I've explained, about uh, funds that uh, are not uh, uh, traditional own resources or own resources to begin with. These are uh, monies we borrow, which uh, are entered into the budget, sorry to be a bit technical, as, as so-called assigned revenues, um, which uh, are subject to exactly the same uh, accountability and transparency uh, uh, rules as, as ordinary appropriations. So they would also be picked up uh, by uh, uh, the Court of Auditors, they would be looked at, and the Parliament in its discharge procedure would take full account of it. So, so that's important. Uh, there, there is a lot of accountability built into the proposal, given that these monies uh, go through the budget. Secondly, uh, the uh, 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 Parliament, of course, through the co-decision uh, uh, procedure, is fully involved in uh, adopting the sectoral le uh, legal basis. And you know, these will be enriched in a number of cases with articles that allow these sectoral instruments to actually process to use these uh, borrowed uh, borrowed funds. So the Parliament is also involved in that. And finally, the Commission has suggested that uh, in the context of uh, the, the annual uh, uh, budget process, 
it would be natural to, to, to have a discussion uh, between the two arms of the budgetary authority about uh, which, which share of these funds would, would, would actually be, be, uh, be used in the year for the different instruments, given that they are also uh, running through the annual budget. And to be very concrete, if you take uh, this week's uh, Commission proposal for the 2021 budget, which translate, uh, translates, if you will, the, the MFF proposals into an annual budget, so you can actually see what it looks like in very practical and granular terms, then you can actually see exactly uh, what will be on the, on the table of the budgetary authority. And I, I think that should, should, should reassure people. Um, okay, thank you. Um, going back to the own resources and, 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 and the plastic levy, which is attracting a bit of attention, um, Dennis Kredler is asking why uh, focusing on plastics only? Uh, wouldn't an expansion to cover all packaging waste, not only plastics, lead to higher revenue, um, given that other materials um, don't re get recycled? Um, and if I may add to this, um, some may argue that a, re a levy on plastics will eventually over time lead to lower resources because that's the purpose of a, of a, of a tax like this. So when you will have less no recycled material, the, the revenue will, will go down as well. Um, so if you could please elaborate on this too, why just plastics and, and, and the, the long-term impact of this kind of, um, of revenue sources? Yeah. Well, you, you know, th don't forget, we made this proposal in May 2018, and this is not a new proposal that, that comes for the first time with uh, this communication we adopted uh, on the 27th of May. Um, and uh, a key issue in all of this uh, uh, has been, uh, and still is, uh, today the empirical basis, the, the hard information that allows us actually to set uh, the allocations uh, uh, to member states. And this has, as you probably know, uh, been a, uh, an issue that has been discussed extensively in the context of uh, recycled plastics. If you wanted to broaden this to other uh, forms of, uh, uh, of waste, then, then you know, this, this this discussion would be magnified uh, several uh, several times over, and and therefore uh, it is important that uh, something doesn't just work uh, conceptually in theory, but that can actually be implemented in practice. Uh, um, on the uh, gradual reduction in revenues from uh, from the Pigouvian uh, 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 contribution, uh, so to speak, uh, yes, uh, that 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 is true. Of course, that. Uh, uh, we would hope that uh, un unrecycled plastic uh, waste would, would, would decrease, uh, but yeah, this is not going to happen uh, overnight. Uh, and, and in fact, member states tax uh, systems have many uh, uh, revenue uh, generating uh, taxes and levies that uh, purport uh, the same objective. Think about uh, levies on cigarettes, uh, think about energy taxes, uh, carbon taxes, and, and therefore uh, uh, it, is, it is quite natural that uh, this features in the uh, in, on, on the revenue revenue side of the budget. Uh, once once you know we we would see uh, the uh, uh, revenues from this instrument decreasing over a longer period of time, then I, I imagine I'm, I'm speculating that for the next MFF one would look at the rate uh, uh, again uh, the contribution rate uh, uh, because again important to underline this is about contributions uh, from member states budgets. This is not a tax the EU uh, uh, is proposing uh, to impose. So. If we're talking about relative shares, uh, then uh, uh, that could uh, could also uh, uh, be unaffected by uh, decreasing consumption uh, overall. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, a more broad, um, a broader question uh, from Ria Katz from the Dutch uh, Financial Daily. Um, what would happen if, um, in the future, our member states will not be able to pay back his contribution to the EU? Um, what would happen to the debt repayment um, that has been issued of the debt that has been issued by the Commission? Uh, will other member states have to pay extra? And what does the treaty say in this in this case? Well, uh, this is a, an, an important point. I, I mean, it's very important to note that there has never in the history of the EU been any uh, incident uh, in terms of member states not paying their national contributions. And not even in the heart of the financial crisis when some member states were in a very, very difficult uh, position. Uh, 
there has never been a case where they didn't pay their contribution. When, when Greece went through a debt restructuring, uh, which was historical, that uh, was the, the biggest debt restructuring in world history, uh, there wasn't a, a deadline missed in terms of paying contributions to, to, to the budget. So uh, important to, to, to keep uh, this in mind. Uh, secondly, um, what, we, what we foresee is uh, uh, what characterizes the, the own resources system of uh, the union, namely that if there is any delay in the payment, this would be proportionally and purely on a temporary basis picked up by other member states, but it would be regularized thereafter. Um, uh, so that uh, uh, we are always clear that the budget does not, I repeat, does not have a joint and several uh, liability structure. It's not the case that everyone is responsible for everything, to put it in very simple terms. You're resp responsible for your share, and only if there is a, 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 a temporary deviation in payments uh, would you be asked on a proportional basis again to, to, to cover for that, but you would be repaid afterwards. And as I said, I think, I think honestly, this discussion is, is really very, very theoretical because there's just no evidence whatsoever that, that this is a, 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 a realistic uh, a concern. I would say we already have uh, liabilities uh, in, uh, in the EU budget uh, that are long term, uh, that we know that need to be financed where exactly the same issue arises. So uh, I'm, I'm not, not worried about that. Okay, thank you. Um, indeed, it's a, a remote uh, possibility. Um, let's um, let's change focus a bit and, and talk about the the role of the European Investment Bank. Um, the 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 next generation EU um, would increase considerably the budget of Invest EU fund, uh, which is um, mainly challenged to the EIB, the investment bank. Um, how how is the role of the investment bank um, changing uh, thanks to next generation EU? Um, and, and what would you expect um, are, are the main yes are the main changes to to the structure and to the kind of uh, investment they will they will carry out um, through next generation EU? Yes, well, um, as you say, Invest EU is expanded uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Qualitatively, we are equipping it with a a new strategic window for strategic investments. Uh, in value chains uh, and, and, and in terms of size, it's, it's significantly increased, as I said. Uh, now, InvestEU uh, would be dispersed uh, largely through the EIB, but not exclusively, as you know. Uh, uh, so uh, that would mean uh, more work and more activities. And on top of that, we are proposing to use uh, uh, FSI, the, the Juncker Fund, as it is sometimes called colloquially, uh, to uh, uh, offer uh, solvency uh, support. Uh, that is an instrument which already exists today. InvestEU is a new instrument that would come uh, online uh, from the 1st of January 2021, but invest, uh, the FSI instrument already exists today, and we want to use that to uh, 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 ensure that uh, the private sector can recapitalize fundamentally sound enterprises through a guarantee that would be awarded by, by the EIB to these investors uh, in funds or in uh, special purpose uh, uh, vehicles. Uh, and that would be backed up by a provisioning in the EU uh, budget. So that's more work. And, and obviously we are discussing uh, very intensively with the EIB uh, uh, how that uh, affects our collaboration and how it affects the EIB. Thanks. Um, thank you. One, one more question on um, something a bit different, uh, which is state aid. Um, the Commission has um, lifted most uh, state aid restriction, uh, restrictions in order to allow member states to um, better target their, um, their economy and the industrial sectors. Um, there is something um, that is causing a bit of doubts, which is the fact that uh, Germany accounts for half of the total state aid that has been given uh, in the EU. Um, does this constitute uh, a distortion of the level play field within the single market? Um, is this um, um, addressed um, at all by next generation EU? Or uh, how does the Commission see this in the future when presumably the exemption will, um, will, will cease to exist and we will go back to, to, initial, to the initial framework? Well, uh, Matt, I would make two comments. First, uh, 
I would not say that uh, the state aid rules have been lifted. Uh, I think that that is not correct. Uh, what has happened is that they have been adapted uh, to the particular circumstances in which we find ourselves, which uh, 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 make it uh, desirable from an economic point of view, from an internal market point of view for member states to be able to give liquidity uh, and capital support to fundamentally uh, sound uh, enterprises who are uh, affected by this crisis, which uh, is a symmetric shock uh, that, that, that needs to be uh, addressed. So uh, that will eventually uh, uh, be changed again when we exit uh, the crisis, uh, but it is the appropriate response. And in fact, it's exactly what we did during the financial and economic crisis. Now, on your second point, obviously it is true that uh, some member states have much more fiscal space and they do much more. That's a good thing in principle. Uh, it doesn't lead to distortions, which, which happen at the level of individual enterprises as such, uh, but it, it, it does lead to divergences uh, in the internal market. And, 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 and we are obviously minded to protect the internal market as much as possible. And this is exactly why we have proposed this uh, solvency instrument, which uh, aims at facilitating the recapitalization of fundamentally uh, sound enterprises through the private sector, but on the back of an EU guarantee. And this instrument is targeting those member states with more limited fiscal space and those that uh, are hardest hit by the crisis. So obviously this is not going to be deployed at scale in Germany. Germany is doing it itself, as you say, but other member states who are weaker uh, would need uh, also to be able to see their uh, uh, sound uh, enterprises being recapitalized. So the commission is very attentive uh, to this point, And that's why we consider that this uh, solvency instrument really is an important, very important part of the uh, uh, the uh, instrument uh, kit. Thank you. Um, thank you. So we are moving towards the end of the event. So if anyone in the audience has one last question, please um, type that in now. Um, one last question for me is um, about the politics of all of this. So the member states will meet um, in three weeks or so on the 17th of July. Um, what would be your message to them uh, to, to ensure that they, they did find an agreement and, and, and what kind of agreement? Well, I, I think I would like to repeat something I said earlier on. This is a win-win game. It's you know, often when you do a budget negotiation, whether it is in a company, in a household, at member state level, the thinking is zero sum. What I get, you don't get. Here, you need to escape that logic and see that this is actually something that will make all of us stronger. That's very, very important. So this is a, a very different time. It's a very different time we live in and a very different type of, of negotiation. Second point, it is really very urgent to agree. You've already, I think, very uh, articulately uh, explained uh, that, uh, you know, there's a lot that needs to happen until we can actually spend the money. So we need this agreement in July to ensure that it actually comes in time. Uh, you know, it doesn't really make sense to continue negotiations in detail uh, 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 if uh, that simply means that uh, uh, we uh, arrive at a point in time where, where the instrument uh, would come too late. Uh, that would be terribly uh, damaging. Thirdly, don't underestimate how well received, I, I say that without any arrogance, don't get me wrong, but how well received this package is in the international financial markets and internationally. You know, we obviously I, I will be responsible for having to borrow this money, so I, I'm talking a lot to investors. And I can tell you that international non-EU investors see this extremely positively. Um, and they see this extremely positively for two reasons. One, a political reason, because it clearly demonstrates that the EU combines solidarity with economic self-interest collectively to get out of this stronger together, which is a vote of confidence in the EU as an entity. Uh, and, and, and that is welcomed uh, by uh, the financial markets. And secondly, this borrowing itself is seen very positively because it is an expression of uh, fiscal uh, uh, firepower that the EU is using collectively to address common problems. And that is something they're very keen on in investing. So, you know, we, we, should, we should not forget that we're onto something that is widely recognized as actually addressing the real problems in a way that makes sense. Uh, don't, don't disappoint the world. Don't disappoint the financial markets by kicking the can down the road. Thank you, Gertian. Um, we didn't get any other questions, so I think I will close the event now. Um, we discussed a lot, uh, technicalities, uh, how it will work in practice, the next generation EU. 
uh, but also broader messages of the need to respond to such an exceptional situation with exceptional measures that are targeted uh, and a win-win, um, like you said. Um, thank you very much uh, for the time, uh, for being clear as always, and for answering all our questions. Um, best of luck with all the work uh, that you have coming up in the next few weeks, and we hope to, uh, to have you back soon, hopefully uh, once the agreement is finally final. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I wish everyone a good afternoon. Thanks a lot, Mark. But uh, goodbye to everyone. It was a pleasure Thank being you. with you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.